Let us stand and join in singing hymn 435. Please join me in the call to worship. God's reach is endless. God's mercy is unstoppable. God's grace is lavish. God's love is constant. God's wisdom is vast. God's hope is stubborn. Thank you. Please be seated. Are there any announcements at this time? morning. We do have some cookies down there for fellowship time after the service, so please come down and join us for coffee and cookies. Um, September 11th is our annual uh, picnic, the Welcome Back Sunday. A lot has happened in that day. Um, service starts at 11 that day, back to 11 o'clock service, so the picnic will be immediately following. I'm looking for pop-up tents and strong guys to help bring the tables outside and chairs outside to the front like we usually do, weather permitting. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Any other announcements? Yes. Oh, um, before before Bob Green, come on down. Well, the price is right. Bob, we just have a little token here for all the.
We have fun planned even today. Um, thank you. So let's give Bob a round of applause. I wrote a thank you on the back of the announcements, and there are many announcements, a uh, growing number of announcements on the back page. If you did not grab one of the bulletins, please, on your way out, do so, so you can see the activities coming up. Um, Bob came to us at first uh, after a desperate plea, and he came saying, I'm retired, and I... Uh, earn a decent living, so I don't need income, but what I want to do is be able to bring uh, a little more energy, um, a little bit more unrehearsed spontaneity to the worship service, and we have had that. Um, he has, I think, lifted our spirits in many ways by the song selections, as well as um, impromptu questions to the congregation, uh, Trivial Pursuit, which we will continue even today. So thank you so much, Bob. We come believing that Jesus Christ came to save us. Saving us means that we needed to be saved. There were parts of us that were broken or unhealthy or injured. And we needed something beyond medicine. We needed something beyond our next door neighbor or our spouse or a friend giving us comfort. We needed God's love. We come here today admitting that God's love is what keeps us going. God's love is what makes it possible not just to make it through the day, but to celebrate the love that exists because of God in the world around us. Let us take a deep breath in, let it out. Hear the loving God that exists for all of us say that you are mine and I love you. Take another deep breath in and let it out. Let us reflect on God's love together. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, who is rich in mercy, we come before you humbled and in need of your grace. Many of us have been in the church for so long that we have forgotten how each day your mercies are new. We lose sight of your grace sustaining us from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, in year to year. We begin to take your forgiveness for granted. We sometimes feel deserving of your grace, and so we have a difficulty forgiving others. Restore in us wonder at the depth of your mercies and help us live out your love with humility, kindness, and gratitude. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us continue as we offer our own silent confessions to our God.
Amen. For God so loved us that he gave us his only begotten son. For God so loved us that he came into the world in the midst of suffering and difficulty to say, you are the one I love. You are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, know this, that it is through Christ Jesus that our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let us stand. seated. The first reading is from Psalm 107 verses 1 to 3 and 17 to 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and the west from the north and the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. This is the word of the Lord. And hear now the word of scripture as it comes from Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Here is where Paul allows or informs the church in Ephesus about God's grace and love to us. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh. All of us once lived among them um, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us. And even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, seated and he seated us at, uh, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show us immeasurable riches of his grace 
and in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand and sing hymn 343. All right, please be seated. Mm. Let us pray. You, O oh Lord, by the grace that you give through Jesus, fill us with new life, new hope, a way to see a future where goodness awaits. Allow for this worship service and the message and the minds that hear all be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. A little over a year ago, uh, there was a scandal at a magazine called Teen Vogue. My hunch is none of you subscribe to it. Um, it turned out that there was this lady, Alexi McCammond, who was an up-and-coming star in journalism. She was 27 years old. She gave really great interviews when asked about issues. She wrote incredible journalistic pieces. 
She was a person that believed that we could move into the future with hope. Teen Vogue prides itself on being a magazine that, if people read it, offers us a way into saving the future. And it turned out that Alexei was supposed to be the person leading the cause as the chief editor. It turned out a couple of weeks before she took over as chief editor that a tweet that she had published 10 years earlier when she was 17 years old was out in social media everywhere. And in that little tweet, she ridiculed Asian Americans and she also ended up saying belittling things to gays and lesbians. They were enough to get her fired before she started work. Now, the day that the social media was all abuzz with just how horrific she was, she said, yes, when I was 17 years old, I said those things and they were wrong. And I have changed and I have grown and I came out two years ago when I was 25 apologizing and acknowledging that I continue to be a person that changes and grows. And I hope all of you are that kind of person. It was to no avail. Now, after she loses her job, it turns out that another tweet becomes an uproar for Teen Vogue. And in this one, uh, the woman who discovered the tweet against Alexi has her own tweet in which she offers racist uh, sentiments. And we begin to wonder, is Teen Vogue going to have a circular firing squad and shoot each other down until there's nothing left? Is there no room for mercy? Is there no room for redemption? Is there no room for salvation or change? There was a gentleman who is a journalist for USA Today, Scott Jennings, and he said this, we have an epidemic of gracelessness. gracelessness. Need to practice that. We have an epidemic of gracelessness in America. Is that true? All too often I hear on news and in social media ridiculing the people that aren't like us. And sometimes they have made profound changes, become different people, but it doesn't matter. It's too late. It makes me think of Paul in the message that he offers about those who have faith discover just how powerful God's grace through Jesus is. The, the way he portrays grace is almost like what Jesus said with the father who, when he sees the prodigal son who has taken over half of his income and just squandered it, runs up to that son, not ridiculing, not chastising, not abandoning, but hugging and loving and forgiving. God is just like that woman who loses a coin and spends the entire day sweeping and on her knees searching and finding you and me, the lost coin, and celebrates with a party. God's grace embraces the unembraceable. God's grace stoops down and washes all that is dirty. God's grace is like that mother who lives here in one of our Victorian homes that was made in the 1830s and her child and other children of the neighborhood have been out in the mud and the muck and they are filthy and dripping with dirt and she comes out and does she offer wrath and anger? Does she say, how dare you come to the porch looking like this? No. This mother, who is like God, says, 
go to the side of the house, I'll turn on the spigot, and she makes a game out of spraying the kids clean and then gets them towels so that they can come inside and enjoy some lemonade. God's forgiveness is amazing. Salvation doesn't come by Teen Magazine having the right words to say to fix America. Salvation comes through grace, which has been given by God. It turns out that we love the idea of grace because we need it. Each one of us in this room have stories of how our lives have been hurt and difficult and we've struggled and we needed something beyond just ourselves. We needed that boost of hope and energy and encouragement that could help us wake up and get out of our beds. And we Christians believe that's God's grace. And yet, grace is not so easy to accept. At times, grace is downright hostile to what we want to have happen in the world. C.S. Lewis points out this. He says, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. We want to be forgiven. And yet, what Paul says about grace is that once we receive it, we become we become ambassadors of good works. And good works are basically loving the people we'd rather not. Forgiving the people we deem unforgivable. There is a moment in time when we wake up and we look at the person that we would rather not receive grace and think, boy, God, you are naive. At best and at worst, you're unjust. You're allowing this horrible thing to take place and you are not trying to accuse or blame or punish. You're trying to love and forgive. You are working to help that person change so that they can be a part of your gift to the world. And I don't like it. There's this sense that God becomes a mixture of false moral equivalencies. You know, in our minds, we know exactly which morals are the best ones, and we have a rank order of what morality is, and hey, we happen to get into the boat of God's love because we at least make it to this level of morality. They don't. They're not invited in the boat. I am. You go to church, you are too. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says that it is not about good works that anyone would be able to boast. Paul is pretty clear. Paul says this about you and me, that we are dead through our trespasses and sins. Not that they are, that we are. And there's this moment in time where God says, I hear you believe in me. And I've already forgiven you. So you don't deserve it because you now change. I already gave it to you. And now you see it and believe it. And you're going to hold on to it and you're going to live it. And that's going to make your life better. It's going to change you and transform you. Because now you are living through my grace, and you are living to give my grace to others. He goes on to say, it's for grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not the works of anyone so that no one may boast. For we are what God has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he happened to be prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We are dead 
through our sins and trespasses. So often it is easy to see the other folks and understand that they are the ones who are dead to sins and trespasses. It's easy to look at another person and say, you are disgraceful. And yet, at the same time, not have the ability to look in the mirror and say, I am also disgraceful. Now, Paul is not saying this to put a heavy burden on our hearts. He is not doing this to make us have to do things that we cannot stand doing because we have to be nice to the people we don't want to be nice to. He's doing it because if we're able to break through that sense that we are better than others, that we deserve more than others, if we're able to break through that barrier and see all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, then we begin to live life differently. And we're able to hear God's grace for us all the more fervently. Uh, there's an American proverb that many attribute to Maya Angelou. She might have just done a good job of reminding people of the saying. It says, I've learned that people will forget what you've said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. We can be right about something and do such a good job of saying how right we are and nobody is going to care. We can go out and do the right thing and have people shaking their heads with disgust at who we are. But when we go out to say God's love that has been given to me has been given to you, and I am going to work my hardest to help you feel God's love. They remember that. They hold that. They want to share that. That's what the good news is all about. It's not telling people to believe this or that. It's first to let them know they are loved and blessed. We get to be the, the children of God. We get to be the saints of our Savior, going out and doing what he did for us. Um, your pastor got to go on a backpacking trip with his son, Matt, and here we are at the beginning of the trail. Look how happy we are. Uh, not a drop of sweat on us. We're so clean, unbelievable. In just three days, we would be covered in sweat and there'd be dirt all over. We'd be tired. I would be in devastating pain. Um, so day two comes along and we're walking and there are these green little bushes. We think, oh, how cute. And they happen to be something called stinging nettles. We're wearing our shorts, not knowing what a stinging nettle is until it feels like there's been bees that have been stinging us. It hurts. And then once that hurt is subsided, it only takes five minutes, then we have hiking shoes on that we just bought, which is nice, except for our shoes aren't used, to, our feet are not used to those shoes. And when you're hiking on a trail, it's not a sidewalk that's all level. There's rocks, you're twisting your ankle here and there, and you're going down a steep hill with weight on your shoulders and everything hurts and I start to cry like a baby I start to complain and complain I could not be more miserable company to Matt if I had picked his worst enemy to go backpacking with him and then after one excruciating whine of why do I have to hurt so much this little light of mine, I'm a gonna let it shine. Matt starts singing. This little light of mine. He's like, Dad, we've only got three more miles to go. Anybody could walk three miles. 
And then we start one after another trying to figure out what are those silly songs that we grew up knowing that we might both know singing at the top of our lungs. That was God's grace. <laughs> My son had to remind me that I'm actually having a great time. <laughs> and I was. This is one of my high points of my summer, being in destitute misery because my body ached. But my heart was singing for joy because I was out in God's creation with my son whom I love. I couldn't have it any better. Maybe get used to my shoes. The reason I bring this up is that every day there are these glimpses of God's grace in our lives. And it is so easy to overlook them because we've got those stinging nettles at our legs and they hurt and, and our back doesn't feel so good and the doc didn't have a solution to my problem and I hate getting up in the morning. <sighs> this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. There's little moments of grace right there for each one of us. And I go for a bike ride a couple times a week with the same guy. And I tell myself, I'm only going to say positive things today. Our bike ride is between two and three hours long. <laughs> I, I ask you all to do this little experiment. Talk with somebody for two to three hours and never say a negative thing. It's not so easy, and yet it's amazing. Turned out on my bike ride when I refused to say any negative things, <gasps> there was a lot of quiet. <laughs> because my brain had not been trained to look at the little wonderful things that make my life better. And I'm an ordained minister that believes that we have to believe in the grace of God in order to have a life worth living, to have a life worth celebrating. And I wasn't willing to look at the grace of God that comes to me every day in these little ways. Salvation comes through God's grace. And God's grace comes to us over and over throughout our days, even when our existence is pretty minimal. And we've been trained by the world to look at negativity, to see the things that weigh us down. And they weigh us down because that's what we're looking at. And God's grace says, look at me. See the little moment here, that little song there, that little advertisement that actually made you laugh. God's grace is right around us all the time. Open our eyes and let's take a look. We get to be a part of God's salvation in the world because God gives us love, those moments of grace, and they add up and they well up and they give us the ability to smile and say something kind to another person, to do something unexpected that shocks and surprises the people around us. To belt out a song that is silly in the midst of pain and misery. Let us go forth believing in the grace of God. Let us go forth seeing the grace of God. And let us go forth being the grace of God. At this time, let us stand and sing the old rugged cross, 327. <laughs>
Please be seated. And um, Bob, what is the name of that instrument? That is a euphonium. A euphonium. Not to be confused with a tuba. Thank you so much. It's a tenor tuba. Excellent. Um, at this time, are there any joys or concerns that people would like to share? Yes, Catherine. So uh, Catherine acknowledges that uh, while having strong convictions about the Lakota Indians and the, the places they live, she realizes she probably tweeted things that did not fit the Christian way of living. So um, yes, we uh, give thanks for God's grace in the midst of having really strong emotions and beliefs. Other yes, Ellen. Okay, so Heidi has uh, we've pre breast cancer. We've prayed for her in the past, and she now has the uh, opportunity to have a new drug regimen, and she's trying to figure out which hospital will be the best for her. So we pray for discernment and wisdom and also for healing. Other joys or concerns? Okay. Uh, we're praying for uh, Keith, who has a heart lesion that needs um, some sort of uh, repair. Yes, Kate. We're praying for Lynn Stankard, who um, is being treated for COVID. And because of her kidney transplant uh, two years ago, um, even though COVID has become a less um, cause for concern in many people, it's still a cause for concern for her. Yes. Woohoo, the farmer's market. So it turns out that we have a little booth at the farmer's market. We sell some hand painted wine glasses from members of the church who did the painting. And we're trying, we are uh, receiving that money in order to go in particular to World Food Kitchen, which is. A uh, world, a program across the globe that makes sure that people um, who are refugees have food, and the food is prepared by chefs, not just, you know, uh, it's not just an army commissary and you're getting reconstituted eggs. They try to make the meal very appealing and beautiful, and try to make it nourishing as well as nice to eat. And so, um, we received. Um, closer to $30, $40, which is more than we've done in the past, which was exciting. Thank you. Any other joys or concerns? Let us come to the Lord in prayer. God, we give thanks that your grace, not our works, are how you look at us. And we are grateful that the grace that you give allows us to share your grace with others. 
Open our eyes, Lord, to the ways that we sometimes, through our own negativity or anger, cause hurt in the world instead of healing. We pray, uh, Catherine, that you help us to feel strong about convictions, but at the same time see the people with whom we disagree as uh, people created in your image, as human beings deserving of respect and dignity. Lord, there's a lot of healing that we need that is physical in nature, and we pray that you are with Heidi as she determines which hospital to get a drug regimen from. And we pray that as she makes that choice, the medicines really will work. We pray that you are with Keith as he goes in to have heart repair. Allow him to feel confident that you are with him and the doctors and nurses will be a part of your healing. And we ask that you continue to watch over and protect Lynn Stankard as she um, goes through COVID. We give thanks, Lord, that you call us to care about other people, whether they be Ukrainians, or people in uh, the Sudan who are struggling to make a life because of being kicked out of Yemen. We pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear how we continue to give. And we give thanks that the farmer's market is one way we can both share your message of help and then also provide it. Lord, we live in a world that has rivers that are drier than they've been in over a thousand years. We've seen droughts and fires and now flash floods in places that need water desperately. And we pray that you're with all the people living in those areas, protecting them. And we pray that you give us wisdom and guidance on how we live as people of faith in a world where the climate is changing all too drastically. We pray that you watch over us in a way that helps us celebrate your love for us. We ask that you join us as we pray the prayer Christ taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With a sense of grace that is always washing over us, let us give to the Lord.
This time, I uh, want to have that last trivia game with Bob while he is still with us. Um, those of you with the plates, if you wouldn't mind just coming forward and sending them down, um, we will sing that song momentarily. Um, that piece that we just heard was um, composed by America's, uh, one of America's greatest composers, and it had a tune that um, kind of had occasional connections to another tune. He was considered the most American of our immigrant composers. Does anybody know who that was? Irving Berlin. Excellent. Uh, point goes to Fluss. Um, so uh, who do you know who wrote the words to the song that we just heard? It came from a poem that was entitled The New Colossus, and it was written by Emma Lazarus. That was a tough one. I did not get that one either. Um, so where were the words that that poem has in it? Where is that found as a symbol of America being a melting pot? Statue of Liberty. All right, we got a couple shout outs. Way to go. Um, what nation gave that statue to the United States? Excellent. Now we got a, the balls rolling. <laughs> um, and they were, uh, what nation? I have France. They supported us during the American Revolution. Okay, next. What is the title for today's offertory? And it's connected to that poem that's on the Statue of Liberty. What's that? Not quite. It is, um, give me your tired, your poor. And so here is the poem, the little section of the poem that is on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Um, many of our ancestors, as they came into America through ships, got to see the statue and hear those words ring out in their own minds as they got to live in a world of new possibility and hope. At this time, let us pray. God, we give thanks for all the blessings that you give us, for all the grace that you pour upon us. Remind us that we don't deserve that grace, but give us the joy of knowing that you give it to us freely and allow for these gifts to be a part of our sharing your love and grace to the world. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our offertory. Let's, oh, let's go right to the hymn. I'm sorry. Let's go right to the hymn. Hymn number 344.
Go forth in the wonder of God's grace and allow it to fill you to such an extent that you share it with those around you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.